and welcome to another RA webcast. Today we have the lovely Matt, who is a Notria's wine educator, but is also studying the very scary master's sommelier's exam at the same time. Now, Matt, over to you. And what would I'd like to know is how did you get into the world of wine? And what do you do over at a Notria? Um, first of all, thank you very much for having me here today. I'm absolutely thrilled to be a part of your um, weekly seminars. So how did I start my career in the wine? Well, uh, it all started five years ago when I moved uh, from Poland to UK. And my first job in London was in a restaurant in Richmond called the Dysert Petersham, which is a one Michelin star restaurant. And the owner of that place, Barney, was very much invested into the world of wine. And he was the very first person that actually introduced me to um, the beauty uh, and the intrigues of the wine industry. So we started initially from tasting several different wines in, um, in a day after the service, before the service. And after a while, I took uh, my chances with level two W set, which I passed, and I landed a job as a sommelier in a French restaurant called the Sondis de Taillevon, so the 110 of Taillevon, which is a French concept. If you're familiar with the uh, movie Ratatouille, it's actually based on the history of the eponymous uh, Le Taillevon in Paris. So the owners um, of Le Taillevon where let's say the story was somehow inspired in Ratatouille by the actual story of that restaurant in Paris. So I spent there six months and after that time I was headhunted by Enotria to join their customer services team and after about a few years I was asked if I would like to join the sales team and in the meantime there was an opportunity for me to take further WSET qualifications, so I became an educator for WSET. And in the meantime, I thought it's just the right time to go back to the original beginnings of actually starting as a sommelier and started doing the Court of Master Sommelier path. So in 2018, I passed my introductory exam. In 2019, I passed the certified. And right now I'm waiting for an invitation to take the advanced um, sommelier exam, hopefully next year, and then we'll see if I want, provided that I pass, then hopefully in the next two or three years I'll be able to take my chances with the master sommelier exam. So yeah, it all started uh, from the front of house position where I was just a simple waiter who got intrigued by the world of wine, and like most of the sommeliers out there, I saw a movie song, the documentary song, which completely intrigued me. And I thought, yeah, there's no way back from it. I need to take my chances and try to do it. So yeah, long story short. <laughs> awesome. Now, Matt, I know, um, you know, people say the word sommelier quite a lot around the, the business. And, you know, a lot of people go, oh, that's quite a fancy word. Now, to you, what, what does it mean to be a sommelier to, to you? Because I know you can be a wine sommelier, but you can also be an olive oil, tea sommelier, etc. But for you, what do you feel the word means? I think the term sommelier um, is very confusing for a lot of us. And even sommeliers themselves struggle to define what a sommelier actually is, because every single person out there will tell you different stories. There's people in the trade that will argue that a sommelier is only a wine person that is directly involved in the service of wine in the restaurant environment. So quite a lot of really influential sommeliers would argue this point of view. However, there's also a group of um, other actual sommeliers that would say that sommelier is not just someone who's involved in the service of wine, but also we can name it, we can call a, some, uh, a person that does buying or professional tasting or wine evaluation of any sorts. Uh, we could call those people sommeliers as well. So for me personally, I think a sommelier is a person that can, that is well experienced and has a lot of theoretical and practical knowledge in this specific field, but is not necessarily tied 
in the service of wine, just like um, head sommeliers for big groups or even training managers, they have extensive sommelier background, but at some point because of the responsibilities they take while they progress, it means they will spend less time on the floor, but more training head sommeliers, junior sommeliers or senior sommeliers. So um, long story short, a sommelier is someone who's working with wine, working with service and working with other people that might directly sell wine or serve wine, but does not necessarily have to be present on the restaurant floor. So you can be a you can be a sommelier um, as a wine educator. Um, so yeah, I'm. I think I would put myself in a group of people that think sommelier is a broad term, is an open term, and you can call yourself a sommelier if you're involved in handling, selling wine. Uh, but most importantly, I think we should specify that predominantly we should call sommeliers people that are actually doing the restaurant service. Yeah. And would you um, say that you'd need a qualification to be a sommelier? Like I know I never had a qualification, uh, but I still called myself a sommelier. But a lot of people are a little bit weird about that. Yeah, I, just like everywhere, like you can be a very passionate amateur historian, but technically speaking, you're not a historian unless you have a master's in history, you're a lecturer, etc. I person, I'm going to, I think having a qualification definitely helps for your CV. It definitely makes you stand out when you're applying for a job because this is, this is a qualification, but the best sommeliers I came across had no qualifications. They've never heard of WSET or Court of Master Sommelier. They, the guys that I'm talking about, they were a few years younger than me. They were basically after hospitality schools in France. They were 18 or 20 when I was 25 and they knew absolutely everything and they had no formal sommelier qualifications at all. Which brings us to a point, will a qualification actually give you what you're after? Not necessarily, it definitely helps, it gives you structure. However, the most important thing is self-study. This is uh, what, what uh, one of the very great master sommeliers, our very own uh, master sommelier, Catherine Larson at Enotria told me a few months ago was, it's not about the pin, which means it's not about the certificate, it's not about the diploma, it's about the journey. Because the mm. journey actually gives you the experience, gives you knowledge, gives you authority. So it all goes back to the concept of you need to be skilled, you need to be competent. The pin will not give it to you. It's the study that you put there and the hard work that will eventually pay off. So I'd say it's more about self-study. Yeah, it's a very special um, industry we, we work in, actually, because so much of it doesn't isn't really tied to qualifications at all, is it? Mm -hmm. Wait, no, so it's really, I, really special. I completely agree. But hospitality is this beautiful industry where we find a variety of people. We we can find loads of uh, loads of um, managers or even sommeliers where this is not their first passion. They have sports background, they have acting background, they come from business schools, they come from acting schools, they've done humanities or maths. But what brings us together is the love of the product, the love of people, the actual uh, fact that we like being surrounded by different cultures, we like being surrounded by different people, original ideas and that's what's really important. And I think that's the beauty and the very unique side of hospitality industry. And that's one of the reasons why, why I suppose I forfeited my original plans to become a lecturer and got so invested into wine. Because at some point it's captivating, it's brilliant, it's illuminating. Every day is different, every day is vibrant. And again, this is the industry where hard work pays off. You don't need a qualification because everything comes with the experience and with dedication. If you if you've got what it takes, if you're determined to get there, you'll get there. You have a question, Steph? I do. I am sure a lot of our um, viewers would love to know what you think is the best qualification to get started. If you have a very sort of base knowledge, 
not too much knowledge, um, but you want to build on it because you want to sort of dip your toe into the world of wine. What would you suggest? Hmm. Sorry, I don't know if that's me. Um, I'd say the, the best way to start your journey with wine is probably to start with the WZ path. So WZ, also known as Wines and Spirit Education Trust, is the examination body created in, I believe, early 60s in UK, which offers four different levels of qualification. So you have level one, level two, level three, level four. Uh, level four is also called the diploma, so it's the final qualification for WZ. So I'd say if you'd like to have a firm foundation and know, have someone explain it to you in a classroom environment, I think level two is absolutely brilliant start. It gives you structure, it gives you a chance to meet like-minded individuals in a classroom environment, in a bit more formal environment, and you also benefit from the attention of um, a wine trainer, so certified educators such as myself and you, Steph, where basically we can make sure um, people have a chance to ask questions. We get to properly explain what's the difference between tannins and acidity, how to detect it. So WSET is brilliant. And at some point when you when you guys uh, pass your level two in WSET, you have a choice. Shall I continue with WSET and go for level three, level four, which is brilliant if you're considering the roles um, such as wine buyer, wine educator, or you you like the, the rather uh, scholarly approach to the wine. If you would like to stick more to an actual love of the product and the service and the whole restaurant and hospitality industry be more specific and look for, you're looking for a qualification more relevant to the on trade to the service of wine then at some point um, your attention will focus more on the master sommelier path and you don't have to go through all of the master sommelier levels at some point you can stop at certified level which gives you what a lot of people are about so they they get the certificate you get a lovely purple pin and you can call yourself officially a certified sommelier. But Court of Master Sommelier is focused on service. They put a lot of emphasis on the service, uh, which means the exam is maybe it's not tough from the technical point of view, because what they examine you on, you do it on the daily basis. You know how to open a bottle. But trust me, when you have a couple of master sommeliers in front of you looking at every single move you make. Uh, it's not about opening a bottle, it's actually it's a battle that you have in your own head and this is what is the most challenging about it. You basically struggle with yourself, which uh, which I think is the most challenging thing about the Court of Master Sommelier. You need to know perfectly well and on top of that, you need to be very comfortable in the stressful environment um, like the exam. So, yeah, it's basically a competition. It's basically people that tried to pass the Court of Master Sommelier qualifications. They they like the competitive side of it. James, I believe you might have a question. Yeah, cheers, Matt. Um, one thing I was going to ask was around kind of palate. And obviously being a sommelier, you have to be quite versed at sampling and smelling and tasting wines and do you think that's something that people have naturally and so people are more natural sommeliers or is it something you can develop with training and time? Hmm. That's an interesting question actually. So from the biological point of view an average uh, person will have any anywhere will have between 2,000 to 8,000 taste buds on their tongues. So uh, Joey Fattorini in one of the documentaries on Amazon um, used a very interesting example of ask yourself what kind of coffee do you like to drink? Do you like your espressos or do you like your coffees with a lot of milk? The more, the closer you are to an actual bitter strong coffee flavours, if that's your preferred drink, that means you're uh, a tolerant drinker which, which basically means um, you have very little taste buds, which is not a bad thing. Uh, on the other hand, if you use a lot of milk, you add a lot of sugar, 
you're something that we call a sensitive taster. So you will prefer wines that are more delicate, more balanced, less tannins. Uh, that's where you start. But what's really essential for sommelier is not really how many taste buds you have. How many taste buds you have will actually determine what you like. Being a sommelier and being a wine educator is really, really close. You're about, you have to develop uh, an idea, an objective idea of wine, how a wine should taste like, what it should be coming from this specific region, why does it taste like it does, and <clears throat> based on that, you'll be able to evaluate the wines and be good at your job as a sommelier or wine educator or wine buyer. It's not necessarily about, uh, it give, you don't have to be born to become a great sommelier. The best sommeliers I know, they're hardworking people that actually focus a lot on the theory, because once you have a firm theory, pra uh, the practical side, the tasting becomes natural. You can identify the wines. Whilst if you don't have a theory, even if you have the best taste buds in the universe, you're not going to be able to tell. So I'd say it's all about theory, knowledge and studies, not necessarily about being a gifted wine taster, but it definitely helps. So just following up on that point, I guess one of the hardest things must be, particularly in an environment which is kind of retail or, or on the floor, mm -hmm. if you're suggesting, you know, wine pairings or suggesting um, a wine for a customer when presumably you haven't tried it before, right? Because there must be thousands of catalogues of even kind of great varieties which you probably have very little exposure to so how how do you handle that how do you deal with that and how, mm. how much of it is is blagging okay. <laughs> i guess <laughs> um, um okay so in the ideal world uh we would like our sommeliers to know um every single wine on the wine list have a chance to try it that's one of the reasons why in the restaurants a sommelier offers to try the wine for a guest to make sure that it's not faulty. So it's not just it's not it's not just a cheeky way to ask a customer a guest for a permission to drink his wine. It's actually part of the service. You know, a lot of uh, wine serving individuals feel bad about suggesting it, but actually from the service point of view and the proper customer service experience, why would you ask a guest to try a wine if there's a possibility it's faulty? If it's faulty, it is your job to actually spot it and suggest, sorry, I, I have to apologize. I have to grab another bottle. This one is faulty. If you'd like to try it, you can always try it, but I would rather give you a new bottle, which will hopefully don't have this taint, cork taint or TCA, etc. So, there's plenty of chances to do it and incorporate it in the service. However, let's face it, there's millions, millions of different wines, tens of thousands of different wines from very small regions as well. They will all be slightly different. So part of the, th that's where the theory is so important because once you try a very well-made wine from a specific region, let's say Chambol Musigny, you have an idea of how this wine should taste like, and then you know what to expect in general. Um, so you can say these wines in general taste like this, taste like that. If you've tried this particular producer, particular vintage, you can you can be more personal, more specific. But most of the guests don't require that level of precise information. Our role as sommeliers or even salespeople is not about bombarding um, a different another person with info that would take hours or ages. Trust me, if you ask a sommelier a question about wine that he loves, he can keep going and going and going and he will never stop. It's about being concise, precise and making sure they the guest understands. Caroline. Hi, Matt. And um, we've got a question here from Anonymous. What is the ultimate wine accolade? education, competitions or experience, which is more important? Hmm. I think it's um, like we said at the beginning, it's not necessarily about the qualifications or the titles. This is something that puts you on the map is in addition to your CV. But uh, obviously 
it is also a great experience and the learning curve. So um, the most important qualifications that you can look for are WSET and Court of Master Sommelier and the Associ Association of Som International Sommeliers called ASI. There's also um, the organization called the Chain, Chain of Rotisseur. Forgive, forgive my French pronunciation. I really don't know how to pronounce that in French properly. Mm -hmm. However, they organized the UK Sommelier of the Year competition for young sommeliers. So um, there's qualifications and there's competitions. Normally you do qualifications to compete, to have better chances, be better prepared. However, uh, from the competition side, you have the UK Sommelier of the Year. This year it's sponsored by uh, Champagne Tatonger, which will take place in November. Normally it would take place in early spring, uh, um, early spring until uh, late June, July. However, because of the COVID that had to be rescheduled. So um, that's UK Sommelier of the Year. You can Sommelier um, of the World, obviously European Championship, there's country championships, etc. There's champagne competitions, so there's loads. I'd say competitions are not necessarily some one of my one of my colleagues, one of the one of the two Polish master sommeliers told me that competitions are not necessarily about how good you are at service. It's about showing off and it's like being on a stage where you're showing you're in a way slightly exaggerating it mm -hmm. just to make it seem more charming, more appealing, where basically it's built this way so you can show off how confident you are, how, how you can explain something that is extremely challenging in a very few words, but also make it entertaining, set up the standards, like bring ideas and genuinely intrigue people. It's a bit like MasterChef formula. <laughs> It's, it's a bit like that. And I, I, I guess that, that's where that, um, you know, back theatre background really comes in handy. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, sommelier competitions, I, I obviously don't want to insult anyone because I'm still try, trying my chances in this year's sommelier of the year competition. But I think it's a bit more about showing the charm, the personality. But of course, behind that, there's loads of knowledge. Don't get me wrong, even though some of the questions there might seem simple, they actually are very complex and the guys participating there, they're really, really top notch. You don't have accidental individuals participating there. James? Uh, I was just going to say, Matt, there's been a lot of press obviously recently um, around how particularly high-end restaurants and um, fine dining restaurants are going to have to change to become more competitive in the kind of the new world, particularly while we kind of see off the end of, of COVID and you know, wait for a, hopefully a, a vaccine to hit. A lot of what's happening in terms of um, wine lists is that they're going to be reduced. So that's what the kind of the information that's being kind of put out there is that wine lists are going to be hugely reduced and kind of how that will impact the role of a sommelier in a restaurant and how you think that kind of role will develop now in the kind of the new normal. Well, um, there's definitely going to be a lot of competition for the sommeliers out there because inevitably due to COVID, there's going to be less opportunities to move from one company to another, to move from one restaurant to another. But also that means that less, uh, not the same number of guests will actually decide to visit that particular restaurant, which means even more than before, there should be more focus on the customer experience and the actually providing them with the best possible service out there. Now, the best possible service is not necessarily about, you know, dancing a ballet with a bottle of wine in front of the guest. It's actually about finding the right balance and making them comfortable. So sometimes you don't have to show off the knowledge, which is the biggest sin for most of the sommeliers I came across where basically they think the moment they get a question they have to you know say Oxford Companion of Wine that says this about this particular producer however there's you know the canter wine spectator etc saying this and that half an hour later we still don't have a wine it's about reading a guest and making sure you offer them what's going to make make them feel comfortable so for that I think we should focus more on our people skills 
and trying to make the guests feel as comfortable as possible, not necessarily about showing off. However, it is important. I mean, sommeliers will always be fine. If you're, if you're working as a sommelier, you have your passion, you have your drive to be as best as you can. And all the challenge there, there is for sommelier is to say, how to say what I'd like to say in 10 words rather than 100 words, and they'll be fine. The challenge for us right now as a whole industry, as a hospitality industry, is to how do we engage the remaining ten, nine persons out of the, the ten, team of 10 so they can offer similar level, which is not hard. We need to focus on how every waiter or even a host can ask a guest that just arrived if they would like an aperitif, be able to suggest something. and. It's, it's a small investment in terms of time, but in terms of the actual increase in the service and the profitability of the business, it's actually a huge step. If we have everyone working in a team, that's great. Like traditionally in restaurants, we have two teams, kitchen and the front of house, and they always do that. They always clash. Whilst within the floor teams in the restaurants, we also have divisions between the food team and the beverage team. They should be all working together, even though we have different skill sets. It's about raising curiosity and encouraging our members of the team to be more interested. So many of you should know what uh, Chef de Rang's job is about, know about the food, because that's essential for food, food pairings, food and wine pairings. Whilst for the Chef de Rang, it's also important to know what wines go, go well, because sometimes you have one sommelier for the whole restaurant and not, not every table can be served at the same time, which brings us to the point that we need better educated teams where it's not just left for the sommeliers to know about wine. They're the experts. They're like someone who's looking after the seller, buying wine, training, and that's where we should be using our sommeliers right now. For training and in, and you know building a proper communication where we have the training team training sommeliers and sommeliers training their own individual teams because one one educator like from my perspective working for an Austria as an educator we have uh, probably around six to seven thousand customers let's multiply that by ten as the number of people working for those businesses if I know one percent of that group is already huge but they know the other percent and they can make sure that the difference, the lessons that we're teaching that one percent go a bit further. Yes, James. I was just going to, I know we're running out of time and um, Step is gesturing in the background, but um, if you had to have one last glass of wine before you die, what mm -hmm. would it be and why? You, you, might, you might think I would go for something um, crazy expensive or something very quirky but i would just grab a glass of wine that would be closest to to my left hand and i would just gladly have it because <laughs> wine and enjoying wine is not about price tag it's not necessarily about the region it's about who you're drinking it with so so to answer to your question i would be happy to drink whatever glass of wine you would all you would give me or that would be next to me as long as I can have it with my closest friends and I would be more than happy with that. Nice. Oh, that's so great. Well, thank you so much, Matt, for for popping on with us today. Absolutely fascinating and nice. a little bit of a taster into the world of sommeliers and, and what we do. Um, so thank you very much and I hope you will all join us next time. Meanwhile, for more information about our program of discussions, please go to RA Group's website at www.ragroup.co.uk forward slash news to download the broadcast links. Meanwhile, if you have any questions or suggestions about how you can get involved, please do email gavin.goody at ragroup.co.uk. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Have a fantastic afternoon and we will see you tomorrow, same time, same place.